All right. I'd like us to turn, please, this evening to the book of Acts in chapter 14. I've been reading some of these uh, scriptures in the morning sessions, but uh, just a, a kind of a review, Acts 14 and verse 7. It speaks very simply. It says, and there they preached the gospel. And then please, if you look at Acts 14, verse 21, it says, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And again, God will bless that short reading of scripture to us. We just want to see the, the apostolic pattern here, uh, that what they did in their first missionary journey, they went to various locations and they preached the gospel. And then once they had preached the gospel and they had seen people come to faith in Christ, they taught them. And then uh, they went to another place, preached the gospel. Then they would come back through again and they would confirm the souls of the disciples. They'd give them confirming ministry, strengthen them, uh, exalting them to continue in the faith. And then they would uh, see the Holy Ghost already raising up overseers. They recognize overseers and they would commend them to God and then move on. And so it was this idea of preaching, planting assemblies, moving on, preaching somewhere else, planting assemblies, moving on, then coming back through, visiting them, see how they were doing. That was the pattern. Now, you realize that uh, one of my my passions on these Saturday evenings is to indulge in my love of church history. And tonight we're going to do some of that too and just see how this simple apostolic pattern was carried out by the early uh, men who saw New Testament truth. And so this is who we're going to be looking at tonight. I don't know if you can see it clear enough, but it's a man called Donald Ross, part of this pioneer series that was published by Gospel Tract Publications in Glasgow. And Donald Ross was a pioneer evangelist uh, from 1823 to 1903. And you might ask the question, why would we want to study Donald Ross this evening? And part of the reason is origins are very important. We, we know how important it is when it comes to the battle for the beginning. Uh, did God speak the world into existence or did we evolve from a bucket of slime? You know, the, the question of origins is very important. And when it comes to the, the history of New Testament principle gathered churches in North America, origins are important too. We often, if I were to ask people, they say, what's the, what's the origin of assemblies in North America? They would probably say, well, it's got connected with John Nelson Darby and it's connected with a gathering of saints in Dublin in the 1820s. Uh, and they would, for the most part, be completely wrong. Assemblies on this continent were not directly connected with Derby or that movement that occurred in Dublin in the 1820s. In fact, um, it was only in the 1930s and 40s where people came out of the Derby meetings that they were now called grant meetings, and they came in in, in huge numbers into the independent open meetings that had been established on this continent. And so that's when the, the influence, if you like, from the Derby side of things came in in the 1930s and 1940s. But actually, the origins of assembly testimony in North America actually go back to Scotland rather than Dublin uh, and Ireland. And I'm sure Miller's already just delighted to hear that because he's a, he's a proud Scotchman. And uh, so he'd be very happy about that. But, uh, but uh, Donald Ross really was the original pioneer of independent open assemblies in North America. So I want to talk about him a little bit. Um, he was born on the 11th of February, 1823, to godly parents in Rosshire, Rosshire in Scotland. And he was brought up in the nurture and admission, admonition of the Lord, and twice each day in the home, they surrounded what they called the family altar. 
And of course, that was a big thing uh, back in Scotland and, and many godly homes. And it's something that needs to be recovered today, the family altar of getting together, uh, reading scripture, praying together as a family. So he was brought up in that environment where twice every day they would sit around the table uh, before they would eat, they'd have the family altar. And of course, uh, uh, he didn't like it at all. In, in fact, um, uh, he would often feign a headache so he could get away from the daily family altar. He, he didn't like it one bit. In fact, in describing himself in those days, he would say of himself, he said, I was as proud as a peacock and as empty as a drum. <laughs> That's his own confession about what he was in those days. But nevertheless, despite the fact that he would try and avoid family worship, uh, he would still pray every morning and every night because he was scared that if he didn't, God would judge him. So again, the influence of this God-fearing home was very real, even though he wasn't converted. But at the age of 15, alone in the heather of a hillside, uh, the Lord brought a scripture, John 18, verse 8, simply says this, if you seek me, let these go their way. And the thought was, if I really seek the Lord, the things that I'm clinging on to, that are holding on to me, I've just got to let go of them, and I've got to seek the Lord. And that's what he did, and he was gloriously converted on a hillside at the age of 15 to the text of John 18 and verse 8. And then he, uh, his family were connected with the established church in Scotland, what we would call the, the, the original church of Scotland, the established church. And, uh, and yet in 1843, uh, there was a big division in the church of Scotland, and he and his family identified themselves with what was called the Free Church of Scotland. Uh, that movement mainly was because the established church had become very uh, both liberal and going through the motions and had lost their gospel zeal altogether. And there were men like Thomas Chalmers, Horatio Bona, uh, Andrew Bona, Robert Murray McShane, William Burns, who were young men fired up with the gospel, and they, they kept getting opposition. Uh, from the, the state church, and so they felt like they were forced out, and they uh, left, uh, many of them uh, were preachers, they lost their manse, they lost their living, uh, and they lost their building, and the whole congregation sometimes would go with them, and they had to start from scratch, and so he sided with this, uh, this uh, disruption in 1843, and uh, moved to Edinburgh, and there he was under the ministry of a man called Mr. Tasker. And this uh, Mr. Tasker really encouraged the saints in that church to get actively involved in evangelism. And so after work, uh, most days of the week, uh, Mr. Ross would give himself to evangelistic labors. And eventually, uh, from in 1858, Mr. Tasker asked him if he would consider uh, overseeing a mission to miners, coal miners in Lanarkshire. And he initially resisted because he didn't want to live by preaching. Uh, he wanted to keep his secular job, and he just felt it would be a bit too risky going out preaching. He didn't want to do that. And uh, even though he wanted to serve the Lord, just this the, the thought of de being dependent on God uh, was, was very hard for him. And yet his employer shortly afterwards terminated his employment, and he recognized that maybe he'd be more secure with the law than he would be uh, in his secular work. And so he went into the work uh, with this mission to miners from 1858 to 1860. And one of the things that Donald Ross said was this, God squeezed him out of secular employment he squeezed him out of missionary uh, societies, and he squeezed him out of his view of infant baptism, and he squeezed him into the truth. And he said it, he never got anywhere without God squeezing him, God putting pressure on him. And he said that would be his story. Uh, but basically, he uh, left uh, uh, secular employment, gave himself to preaching. Now, he had never preached before, and he said to Mr. Tasker, well, what do I do? How do I do this? And Mr. Tasker's advice was very timely. He said this. He says, you preach to your own heart. And then 
you will not be surprised how many other hearts you preach to. Preach to your own heart, and then when you preach, you'll preach to other people's hearts. And I think that's really true. When, when you're preparing a sermon, you, if God doesn't speak to you through the passage, he won't speak to anybody else. You first have got to let the word of God hit you before it will ever hit anybody else. And that was the advice. And so he preached to his own heart and then preached to others, and God greatly blessed his labors. In 1860, he was approached to uh, work with a new mission called the Northeast Coast Mission. And he would labor with the Northeast Coast Mission from 1860 to 1870. Now, that particular mission, uh, it was basically evangelizing fishing villages up the northeast coast of Scotland. And so he based himself in the city of Aberdeen, and then he would go up and down that coast evangelizing any place that he'd have an opportunity to preach the gospel. And during those 10 years, he was greatly used of God in the conversion of souls. In fact, these were glorious revival days. The Holy Spirit worked so wondrously in Scotland, and particularly that northeast coast corridor, thousands of persons of all ranks and classes would arouse from their slumber and were earnestly inquiring, asking, what must I do to be saved? It was a time of wonderful in-gathering. And, and Mr. Ross gathered around him a band of earnest, aggressive gospelers. And war was taken to the enemy. Uh, they, they went on the attack. They attacked the citadels of Satan and, were, and, and, and won the victory and, and saw uh, bars closed, saw brothels closed. They saw pool halls closed as the gospel began to take hold of that whole area. And there were, there were great men of this era. We've talked about some of them in the past. One of them we've talked about was Duncan Matheson. Duncan Matheson preached alongside of uh, Donald Ross, Brownlow North, one that we may cover in another day, quite a character, uh, Hay McDowell Grant, Reginald Radcliffe, the converted lawyer, uh, Richard Weaver, the converted boxer. Uh, these were tremendous evangelists, and it was a time of great uh, zeal, Gordon Fallon, Harrison Ord, uh, just so many of them, and they worked together, laboring up and down this coast and seeing tremendous uh, in gatherings of souls. But part of the, the difficulty that became very evident to Mr. Ross was that so often they get these people saved and they put them in the church and the existing churches, it was like putting live chicks under a dead hen. Because the, the, the problem with that system not just the Church of Scotland, but even the Free Church of Scotland, was that it was all based on an educated ministry. You went to seminary, and therefore you were considered to be a preacher. Whether you were converted or not was not relevant. And so you had a lot of people uh, in these churches, Church of Scotland ministers, Free Church of Scotland ministers, and they did not know anything of the new birth and they were stuffy. Uh, they were they were dull. They had no they had no life. Uh, they were lifeless. And all these new converts are going in to these churches, and they're they're withering on the vine. And that really began to bother him. And so in in 1870, he severed his connection uh, with the Northeast Coast Ministry, and he began the North Northern Evangelistic Association uh, with a few other evangelists that saw the same issue. And yet it was a time when he was, God was beginning to work in his heart. He's beginning to ask questions about some of these things. In fact, an example would be in the summer of 1870, Ross studied the subject of baptism. And he asked himself the question, what about baptism? He said, if I saw it in the word of God, would I be willing to obey it? Because, you know, in Scotland, most of them uh, this time were all pedo-baptists. Sprinkling of infants was the normal uh, business, uh, how they dealt with things. In fact, Ross himself married uh, with 13 children. All of them had been sprinkled. Uh, 
And so if he suddenly sees baptism in scripture, that's going to have a huge impact on everything. And as he studied the word of God, he saw that his thoughts did not line up with scripture. The word of God clearly taught that when somebody got saved, they got baptized by immersion. And so that uh, resulted in him getting baptized in the River D at five o'clock on a Saturday morning at the public baths in Crooked Lane. And I guess they had an area uh, where the, the river came up in the city uh, where people would go and bathe. Remember, they, these are the days before indoor plumbing. And so if you wanted to get bathed or do your laundry or whatever, you do it down by the riverside. This was an area called the public baths. And he was baptized and his obedience influenced many others. And so as a result of that, the baths were used to baptize large numbers of believers for many of the subsequent Lord's days. And so, again, there was a, there was a responding to light. And, you know, there's a biblical principle that if you respond to light, God will faithfully give you more light. That's just a principle. You reject light, or how great is the darkness? But if you respond to light, God will give you more light. So by November of 1871, they see more light. And he says this, the table of the Lord was spread in the simplicity of early times. And so they began to simply break bread as baptized believers with a loaf and a cup in scriptural simplicity. One of the others that labored with him, James Campbell, joined the meeting at that time, and he said it was a beautiful sight to us indeed. We had never heard of such a meeting until we saw it with our own eyes. Several New Testament-style gatherings sprang up, and Ross had his mandate now. He knew what he was to do, severed all connection with all missions, and simply went out preaching the gospel, baptizing converts, and seeing saints gathered in scriptural simplicity to remember the Lord. Soon afterwards, um, they had an opportunity uh, to visit the United States. In fact, in 1876, he would visit the United States of America for the first time. And he recognized that there were much open doors on this continent for the preaching of the gospel and establishing of New Testament patent assemblies. So by 1879, he had moved his family, making Chicago the metropolis of the West and Northwestern states the center of his activity. He had three others who began to remember the Lord with him in the breaking of bread there in Chicago in a tent. They were, they were using the gospel tent uh, during the week, evangelizing, and then they would break bread on the Lord's Day morning in this little tent in Chicago. And uh, a guy from England came, and uh, he was connected with assemblies in the UK, and he came and he joined with them, and he said, he said, this surely is what it means to be outside the camp, <laughs> meeting in this little tent. And so uh, Donald Ross kept pegging away at the gospel, summer, winter, rain, and snow, encouraging uh, others to do the same. And a number of Christians gathered around him, were baptized, sought to teach others what the Lord had taught them. And in this way, the work began to take hold. In fact, there were four assemblies established in Chicago alone through his ministry. But then he began to go to other places, other cities. Kansas City, Missouri was one of the spheres of his labors. San Francisco, California came up into Canada, Hamilton, Ontario, even to Brandon, uh, uh, Manitoba. Uh, I mean, this man was tireless in his gospel labors. They organized the first conference in Chicago of these new gatherings of assemblies. And Caleb uh, J. Baker, uh, famous for gospel charts, uh, he, was, he was a professional tent maker in that he made these big awnings for fairs and circuses and, and gospel tents. He provided gospel tents free of charge to all the workers. And C.J. Baker remembers clearly that first conference they had in Chicago and he was basically very cautious. He said, um, he said, you know, what what should we charge the people just to put them up? You know, we've got people coming from all over. How are we going to handle all this? And so Donald Ross said to, to Baker, 
Oh, he said, do it for God, man. Do it for God. Baker said, do you mean that you would not charge anything? That's just what I mean, he replied. Baker said, well, this will cost at least $200, which, again, we're talking about 1870s, $200. We're talking a lot of shekels at that time. And so his answer was, I never knew anything undertaken for God in God's way that he would not take up the expense. That's tremendous faith, isn't it? I never knew anything. Uh, any, uh, he said, I never knew anything undertaken for God in God's way but he would not look after the expense. And so they went ahead, charged no one for the, com the conference. Accommodation was provided, all the rest of it. The total expense was $199, just as it, so Mr. Caleb Baker was pretty clear. He said 200, it was 199. And that Lord's Day morning, as they broke bread, the collection was $204. Everything was met and some besides. And that became the pattern for their conferences. They would hold conferences, never charge, trust the Lord to provide, and the Lord was faithful to do that. So he continued uh, his labors, and by the time he went to be with the Lord on the 13th of February, 1903, in Savannah, Georgia, because the winters in Chicago were too much for an old man. So he went down and labored in Savannah in the gospel in the winter months. 13th of February, 1903, he went into the presence of the Lord. And at that time, he and his fellow laborers, and there were many, uh, James Campbell, Jim, John Gill, Alexander Marshall, Donald Monroe, John Smith, who would be a great grandfather of Eric Smith, who joins us on the calls. John Smith was one of them. They saw between them over 400 assemblies established in the United States and Canada. And how did they do it? They preached the gospel, just like Acts 14, preached the gospel, saw people saved, baptized them, and then gathered them together to simply remember the Lord Jesus, saw the Holy Ghost raise up overseers, and this was the work that they did. And so, at the end of his journey, he said this, I'll be 80 on the 11th of February, and he died on the 13th, so not long after his 80th birthday. He said, I'll be 80 on the 11th of February, and if I had over 80 years before me, I would spend them in the gospel of God's grace. There's no other work of such importance in the whole world. All other investments amount to nothing compared with this. That was a summary of his life. So open assembly or independent assembly testimony in the USA was, and this is why this is so important for us. It was born out of revival. Remember this this exercise. You've had the 1859 revival in Scotland. He's laboring in those. So it's born out of revival. It, it, it resulted in tireless gospel labor. There were deep convictions about scriptural simplicity, getting back to the simple New Testament pattern. And there were laborers that labored together for the sake of the gospel. And I really believe we're going to see revival. Part of revival is not just giving new life, but it's getting us back to first principles. If you see the revivals in the Old Testament, they always went back to that which had been given by Moses, they went back to the temple worship. They went back to things that God had already told them, right? It wasn't that they came up with new ideas. There was a restoration of the old simplicity. That's what they went to. And I believe a true revival will not only stir us afresh to reach the continent with the gospel, but it will also cause us to get back to scriptural simplicity and get rid of all the nonsense, the ideas of men that just clutter things up and take away the freshness and the beauty of simple New Testament truth. Donald Ross <clears throat> really... Uh, is uh, responsible, much of the labors cause unto God for what we consider to be assembly testimony on this continent. And we need to learn from Mr. Ross.
And may God encourage those thoughts and stir us afresh with zeal for these things. Amen.